Welcome to the Crossboard Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown. And before we get started on today's show, I just want to let you know that if you did not get to listen, listen to episode 381, I would highly recommend stopping right now and actually heading back to 381 and listen to the first part of this two-part episode. And we, we talked about my recent travels back to Ontario, uh, traveling through Toronto and up to Ottawa, and just some of the sights and sounds that we had seen with the impending election in less than two days. Thursday is the election day in Ontario, and we are going to be having a live, 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 live election results on the Cross Border Interviews YouTube channel. So just want to make sure that you, if you haven't already, check out episode 381. This is 382. 384 is going to be our live episode, so highly recommend you check them out. But Let's get back to my storytelling and what I saw on the ground. Now, I left off and we had just been in Ottawa. Now, if you can remember back to the last episode, I was talking about the recent storm that had gone through actually all of sort of eastern Ontario and it caused a lot of damage. So when we were looking for a hotel room on our departure out of Ottawa, we found that... (laughs) let's put it bluntly, there were no hotel rooms because most residents of Ottawa were looking for hotel rooms because their power is out and they had no running water, which is completely understandable at the end of the day. So we started looking outside. Me and my travel companion started looking on the outside. So we looked at Nepean, we looked at Smith Falls, and then we started going further and further southeast, southwest, I should say. So we started in Brockville. There was nothing in Brockville. We started looking in Kingston. There was not much in Kingston. And we were like, wow, this is a really hard task to do, to try and find a hotel room for the night in eastern Ontario. So we did end up finding one. But the under, the un, the sort of the, uh, the, crux of the whole thing was it was in Nepean, Napanee, sorry, the greater Napanee area. So if you don't know, if you've never driven in, which I would highly recommend not doing in the middle of the night, uh, driving from Ottawa to the greater Napanee area, it was a gong show because um, a lot of people were getting out of town, a lot of people were just done with Ottawa area because of the power edit, so they were also leaving the area as well. So we were stuck in traffic, a.k.a. no red lights, so we sort of had to stick to the highways as much as we can. But we did get out. We ultimately did get out of the actual um, Ottawa area, and we got to Napanee, the greater Napanee area, I would say two and a half hours later, when it was supposed to be only an hour and 45 minutes. Now, we did stop for gas. We did stop for uh, some light food on the way but i just want to let you know that it was not a fun drive let alone just a fun experience so we get to napanee and it's about 10 10 o'clock at night and we've been up for a long period of time so we crash we hit the bed and we want to get up early I traditionally get up about 8 o'clock, and I got up, and I was up probably about 6.30, quarter to 7, and I was on the road. I wanted to get on the road, so what I did was I wanted to do some rural areas, and this is where this episode gets a little interesting, because I enjoy rural driving better than urban driving. I am not a big city fan. I do not, I know saying that I live in Calgary, but I enjoy rural because you can just hit the cruise control on 80 and just enjoy the drive. I wanted to see how rural Ontario was actually working out because I had seen Ottawa, I had seen Toronto, I'd seen what was happening on the downskirts, but I had not seen what was actually happening in rural Ontario. So while my travel companion slept for a few hours, I hit the road. I started out, I got a coffee for myself and the iced coffee, and I hit the road as quickly as possible. I probably spent about an hour and a half on the road looking at signs on driveways, signs on private properties, I should say, rural communities, and what I found, for the first part, Lennox Hastings and uh, Lennox Frontenac and Kingston, which is the riding that Greater Napanee is in, 
is the writing of Derek Sloan. Now, if you don't know Derek Sloan, Derek Sloan was the former member of Parliament for Hastings, Lennox, and Addington uh, federally. He ran for the conservative leadership in 2020 against Aaron O'Toole, Peter McKay, and Leslie Lewis. He came in fourth. He got kicked out of caucus after that leadership race. Sat as an independent, moved to, oh, I should say moved, but uh, decided that he was going to run for re-election, but not in Ontario, but out in Banff, Airdrie against Blake Richards. So he moved out here. His wife ran in Hastings, Lennox, Frontenac, and Addington in federally as an independent. He ran out here in Banff, Airdrie. He then decided after losing that election, he had moved back and he wanted to still stay in politics. So he became the leader of the now Ontario party, which used to be the Trillium party, which used to be some other party as well. The Ontario party is running a full slate of candidates and I give them credit. They are pro uh, anti-lockdown, not they're pro uh, freedom of choice. They believe the Bible. So, they are pretty much a very social conservative, social, fis fiscally uh, conservative party. I thought being his riding, his federal riding, because it kind of matched up the federal riding and his former federal riding, he would have lots of support. And being a more socially conservative area, rural Ontario, he might have a lot. I saw more upside down Canadian flags in the greater Napanee area and more the F Trudeau flags flying on uh, rural properties than I saw Ontario Party election signs, election brochures, election material, election everything. And I'm not sure if that's saying something about Aaron O'Toole or Derek Sloan, but if Derek Sloan thinks he's going to win with not a lot of support in rural Ontario, which is which is I'm assuming he believes is his base, he's in for a rude awakening on election day when it comes back that he isn't going to be winning any seats and no poll has him above like two percent right now he could be a force in a few years but not right now so Derek Sloan his own writing is going to go conservative Breezy Rick Breezy is the gentleman's name who's running for the conservatives Daryl Cramp used to be the MLA former MP as well M -M MPP, sorry, former MPP, announced his retirement because of cancer. He was the former MP for Prince Edward Hastings, which if you've ever listened to my show, you know that I have long history with Daryl Cramp. He gave me a private tour of the House of Commons once. It was the greatest honor of my life. His daughter currently represents the uh, federal boundaries. So Daryl Cramp and the Cramps have known that area of quite well. Actually, when we're in Napanee, actually in Napanee, Daryl Cramp's office was literally like perpendicular from the campaign office of uh, this Rick Breezy gentleman. So... I would be highly suspect that the Conservatives uh, don't do win this riding with a large majority. The NDP have a campaign. Their campaign was up in Bancroft. If you know the area, it's probably like the Edmonton to Calgary Drive. So it's kind of far. And then the Liberals had a campaign office literally right around the corner. We stopped in at both the Conservatives and the NDP. And I can tell you this. The demographic of Napanee is not your young buck. Uh, I think the youngest person that I met during the rural Ontario area was probably 55, 60 tops. And I give them credit because they're out there. And these are the passionate volunteers that you really like to see in rural Ontario because they know it's a challenge. They're, they know that the campaign office needs to be open, and it was. So I give them credit. But... Yet again, this one riding, and it's a very small, not a very small riding, but a riding nonetheless, it is going to potentially, potentially see a overwhelming majority vote conservative in the next election. 
Um, I want to talk about Kingston and the islands after the break here because I want to just take a quick break here. And I want to say that this next area in Kingston and the islands is quite a bit. Very, I'm going to talk about Kingston and the islands and Bay of Quinty, my old stomping grounds. Kingston and the Islands because I went to Queens, Bay of Quinty because I went to Loyalist College. So we'll be right back after this and we'll talk about rural urban ridings that are half cities, but they also have very large urban or rural swaths in it. So we'll be right back after this brief, brief message. Okay, talk to you soon. Calgary, Edmonton, Vegreville, St. Albert, Drumheller, Medicine Hat, Fort McMurray, and Peace River. These are some of the communities this show has been heard in. By advertising with us, your advert will be heard by countless Albertans and Canadians. Visit the link in the show notes to advertise with us today. So as I was talking about before the break, uh, we're going to be talking about Kingston and the Islands and Bay of Quinty. I want to start with uh, Kingston and the Islands because these are two writings. Well, I want to start with these two writings and I want to specifically talk about these two writings because they are, let's put it this way, urban rural writings. They are technically part of outside of the Greater Toronto area, so they're not really considered rural urban writings, so they're considered rural writings, but Kingston is a rural area or an urban area, and Bay of Quinty has a weird, uh, the county and Belleville area. Um, I want to start with Kingston and the Islands because uh, I want to I want to take a brief moment and actually say I want to thank Gary Bennett's team, who is the conservative candidate for clearly labeling their campaign office, because as we were driving into Can uh, Kingston and the Islands, our GPS had put in that it was actually further down than what was actually in reality. So we found the riding office when we were actually driving in, we're like, hey, there's all the signs and there's where it says campaign office. So we pulled over, we went in, and I give credit to their campaign because they are a buzzing place. There was a lot of people, a lot of activity, and the uh, the woman who I talked to, um, I asked, oh, I see you have a button. Do you, do you mind if I have one? She looked and she couldn't find one, but she gave me the button off of her coat. And I was like, oh, well, thank you. After that, though, we, <coughs> pardon me for coughing in your ear there, uh, we decided that we would continue on. But before we did, I asked my questions, how's everything going? And what I found was so interesting. And I was hearing this a lot over the, the, the in the urban, the rural areas that I was talking to. The conservatives said their biggest asset is Doug Ford. And I would not disagree with that. Doug Ford is this weird entity in politics. I think there was an abacus data poll that said federal liberals are voting for Doug Ford because they like Doug Ford. They don't like Stephen Del Duca. So he's crossing party politics here. And that doesn't spell, that spells trouble for the NDP and the conservatives if, uh, the NDP and the liberals, if Doug Ford is taking some of their party. Uh, and Doug Ford has been open. He's not a conservative. He's Doug Ford and he's Doug Ford and he's Doug Ford. What type of proof? A proof is a proof. What type of proof? It's a proof. So I give him credit for doing what he did and being able to connect with a marketing background and talk about marketing and uh, pitch himself as the everyday people. Uh, in our interview with Sarah Biggs in a few minutes, she talks about how he is a master marketer and it has helped him and it's pissed off the progressives. So after we did that, we went to the Liberal uh, campaign office, which is currently uh, the, the well, the former MP, Ted, Ted Shu, is running for an MPP position after he resigned in 2019. 2019, Mark Gerritsen, the son of John Gerritsen, former MPP, uh, was running for MP. Ted has announced that he's running. He is probably likely going to pick this up. It's currently held by the NDP, but we'll talk about them in a few seconds. I didn't go into the Liberal head office, but uh, my uh, my traveling companion did, and when she came back out, she said, they they feel like it's a great momentum, everything's going great. And I was like, awesome, this is great. You're giving me information that I can use for this. So we went off to the NDP. So 
The NDP currently hold this riding. The NDP MPP announced that he was not standing for re-election and he was actually going to be doing something else. So they found a sort of a scapegoat to run and I could not tell you the name even though I have one of their buttons and I don't know who it is. That tells you how bad of... I think it's Mary Rita Holland. I could be wrong though. Um... I don't have the information for me. I'm just looking at my button collection. Um, I want to say this. You can tell a campaign's going bad when someone walks in and the first thing out of your mouth is not, hi, how are you? It's, hi, how can we, how can you help us? Uh, the gentleman who was in the campaign office basically asked me repeatedly if I had time to campaign or had time to hand out brochures or potentially had time to, uh, on election day. As someone from Calgary, I didn't. As someone from Calgary, I hadn't. So it wasn't that I could. So I give credit that they were able to be so bold and ask these questions but it just wasn't for me after that we toured some of the side streets in kingston the liberals look like they're going to win this one probably the conservatives are going to get second place taking some of that uh ndp vote from the last election but i've seen weirder things happen before <laughs> After after we left Kingston, we went to Napanee. We talked about Napanee at the beginning of the top of the episode, and I'll leave that for that. But then we went to the Bay of Quinty. The Bay of Quinty, as I like to call it, the Todd Smith riding. Todd Smith is the former radio journalist, radio of a former sports guy in Belleville, and I can tell you he is a well-liked man. I compare Bay of Quinty to ridings like King's Hands, Scott Bryson's riding. Scott Bryson was a PC, flipped to the end of the Liberals, and he won with a larger majority. Todd Smith will do the exact same. No matter what Todd Smith does, he will win this riding. I, I, I feel bad because I know the Liberal team in this riding because I used to work for the Liberal team when Ken Cole was there, when uh, um, Leon Dombrowski was there. I This was my riding, Ernie Parsons. I remember those guys, Lyle Van Cleef. These are, these are the people that I know and I grew up with and I helped out on. So I'm not expecting Todd Smith to lose, but... It has gone liberal federally. Neil Ellis, former mayor, held it from 2015 to 2019. Currently, Ryan Williams, the former son of the uh, mayor of Trenton, currently holds it for the Conservatives. So I don't know, but I suspect that Todd Smith is going to win this riding quite easily. And I'm going to say, Todd Smith, watch out. Because Todd Smith is going to be, watch us watch Todd Smith. Todd Smith is going to be a candidate for the leadership once Doug Ford steps down. He was intending to uh, put his name forward after Patrick Brown uh, stepped down, but he ultimately decided to throw his support behind Christine Elliott, and the rest is history because Doug Ford was uh, won that election. I can see uh, Todd Smith potentially being the a candidate for leadership in the coming years if Doug Ford steps down after this election. Because usually two terms and you're done. McGinty tried three, didn't work. So after Belleville, we went to the, after the conservative uh, campaign. They didn't have any buttons or signs that they would want to give us. In my old dentist's office, actually, I found that quite ironic because as I was touring, I was like, I've been to this building before that I had flashbacks of people drilling my mouth with uh, tools. And I was like, oh, that's right, because it's my old dentist's office. After we got to the conservative office, we went downtown Front Street to the... Uh, NDP office where they told us Andrea Horvath was going to be in the area. We weren't able to go because I had to go meet my grandparents. And then we went to the Liberal. And I can tell you, in my entire eight years in Belleville, I had never stepped foot in the mall that the <laughs> that the uh, Liberals had their campaign office in. So I was a little shocked. So I went in and I uh, had never been into the building. It's right on Front Street. It's on the front and center of the front and uh, well, first, if I'm not mistaken. And I went in and there were people in there that I remember from when I was on the campaign trail with Ken Cole, when I was uh, working with Daryl Cramp, when I was working with their, uh, Leon Dombrowski. I was so shocked. 
I don't think they recognized me. I said my name a few times, but no one perked up. So maybe it's it's here or there. And it's been a few years since I've been there. So here we are. Um, my last thing I want to say is uh, after leaving Belleville, I remember why I left Belleville and I didn't come back. Because it was growing then. And I know I live in Calgary now, but geez, I, I thought uh, Belleville was going to be this quaint little community, but I guess not. Uh, I give I give the Liberals a shot, but I think Todd Smith is going to win that riding. After we left Belleville in the Bay of Quinty riding, we moved to the Northumberland Peterborough South, which is where my parents live, and we stopped and see my grandparents. And then we, after five days of on the road and going, 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 I stopped in Newcastle and put my head down for the night. And then the next morning we got back up and we did a few more ridings, not that many. We did uh, Durham, Whitby, Oshawa. We didn't get many signs because, yet again, not a lot of campaign offices open in the GTA on uh, 8 o'clock in the morning at, on a Friday with a week left of the campaign. But that's, that's here nor there. I give credit where credit is due. So we will be right back after this brief uh, commercial break, and we'll be back with a brief uh, chat with Sarah Biggs, our political analyst, and we're going to talk about the election and the election that was not an election in some sense. So we'll be right back after this brief commercial break, guys. Talk to you soon. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to Patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. As I promised, we are with Sarah Biggs to end this episode, Tuesday episode, off on the recap of the Ontario election and what the potential vote is going to be like. And just to let you know, we will be live on election night at 7.45, Thursday, June 2nd, with guests from across the political spectrum. And myself, and I believe Sarah is going to be there as well. She has graciously offered. And I think if I'm sort of putting her on the spot, I did not prepare her for that, but I think she's going to be with us. Right, Sarah? Sure. Uh, <laughs> sure. Um, so Sarah, I just got back from Ontario. If anyone's listened yeah. to the Monday show and the Tuesday, well, if they're listening to this, they listen to the first part of this episode. The, the the apathy in that province right now for this election is so slow. I've never seen a voter like so apathetic about what's actually happening in an election than I have in this election. I know you weren't on the ground, but what are you no. hearing from people on the ground in Ontario? People are tired. Like, and also progressives have a huge problem right now. Like sometimes we're saying, yeah, we don't want to end up in two party situation, but sometimes uh, the two party situation would be the most viable option in some scenarios. In Ontario, what Ontario's case is that everybody was complaining about Ford. Everybody was whining about Ford. And what are we looking at? Like 80 seats? Like what, what is wrong with Ontario? Like the left hand is not talking to the voting hand and they're not able to like, I, I was looking at numbers and yeah, the, the progressive needs to do something. What's gonna happen is that Horvath's gonna be blaming the liberals for her not winning. And then the liberals will be blaming the voters. So that's going to be interesting to watch. And then Ford's just going to be winning, right? Um, it, 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 there's ex something extremely, extremely, extremely broken in Ontario right now. And I think that we're going to have to do a full postmortem of what's going on over there. Um, because from what, what I'm hearing, like they're gluttons, they're gluttons for punishment, really. So I was in the downtown core, the Monday episode, yeah. I talked about Toronto and Toronto is a hub in itself, right? Like you leave Toronto, it's a completely different province than it is in downtown yeah. Toronto. 
And the, the, the apathy in Toronto was huge. People wanted to get it vote, but that's where progressives traditionally have done well. The Ontario Liberals, the Ontario NDP have traditionally do, done well. Doug Ford's giving them a run for his money, but traditionally the progressives have done extremely well downtown Toronto. You leave downtown Toronto, you leave the uh, 416, no one cares. I, I was talking to my family member who said, I don't want to vote for the PC, but I know the PC is going to win. So if I vote for someone not the PC, there's no point of voting. But if I vote for the person who's the PC, he's going to win anyway. So my vote really doesn't matter. So that's, it's a for, it's a foregone conclusion to a lot of people right now. But that's one of the most uh, voters' apathy that we can see out there is that voters feel that no matter what the outcome is, like their vote does not matter. And I think that we, you know, the parties need to be working on that messaging that every single vote matters because not only they're going to be getting vote, more votes in their own writings, but they're going to be get, getting more money too from the provincial funding. They receive a certain amount of dollars per voters they get. And that increases funding for the party as well. And I think that we really need to go back to the basics and really trying to explain to them, yeah, okay. It's like, I live in, I live in Cal Calgary, Glenmore. It used to be Jason Kenney's old writing um, before there were changes on the map. Everybody's conservative here, but it is still encouraged to vote for the party of your choice because it, it's a democracy after all. And that's what people need to understand. A vote is a vote and always be a vote. It doesn't matter who you vote for. You do not let, you know, projections and pollings um, discourage you to vote, I would yeah. say. They should be encouraged people to those polls. If people are very dissatisfied with the Ford government right now, they should be encouraging people to get out and vote. Not do the opposite and be like, oh, no, just stay home because no matter what's going to happen, Ford's going to win. Like it creates kind of a, a Neor syndrome of, uh, yeah. well, we're, you know, there's just going to be sitting there and complacent. But like one of my uh, friends, Erica Ifill, hi, Erica, she's, um, she has a podcast in Ottawa and we recorded last week. And like she said, uh, you know, <laughs> Doug Ford that killed grandma. And it's going to be going in again. Yep. Even if there's, but it's just, it well, just shows broken everything is right now. I, I want to, I want to mention something and I want to, because you've ran it, you've ran campaigns before, right? Like you've actually camp managed a few, like maybe local campaigns, maybe provincial yeah. campaigns. I've managed them as well. Yeah. The very few first few days, and this being Saturday, Sunday, Monday, yeah. I would get to campaign offices to see how everything was going on the ground at 10 o'clock in the morning, and no one was there. Like the liberals and the progressives had not opened their campaign office at 10 o'clock on a weekend before the election. Now, I'm not the only person who is shaking their head at this probably because I'm in the opinion that if you are a week and a half out, you have no idea what's going on. You open your campaign office at like two o'clock in the morning and you close at midnight. You get two yeah, hours you're of open sleep. 24 seven. You don't get sleep. You sleep in the office. Yeah, exactly. But the, the progressives and even there was a few Ontario PCs, the ones that I could find they're, they're like, I don't know what's going through their head, but even they're apathetic about the election, it seems like. Everybody's coming out extremely exhausted from the past two and a half years. It's been extremely difficult on morale. Um, but, you know, with everything that happened in Ontario for the past two and a half years, you'd figure that people would you know, get more engaged and more involved in the process. Uh, to me, like campaign office needs to open like crack of dawn, especially yeah. a week before election, like before E-Day. And you should have your door knockers ready to go. You should have your literature. 
and you should have your campaign man your office manager in there dealing making calls heck even hire door knockers to make sure that everything is canvassed properly because people don't answer their phones anymore so it's hard to canvas through ivr polling right yep. there was a big reality change that we are seeing happening right now we're seeing different trends in the field but why would the candidate not be there at eight o'clock is he showing up at queen's park 11 30 and goes for lunch it i don't i do not understand that like no i remember first campaigns like we were up at six yep like and we're just going like this is how we you know this is how Ken hair got in calgary centers it's because it was open dead early and it was closing extremely late and they were door knocking every single day he was out there starting at 7 a.m and he would go to bed at midnight one o'clock like the dude did it like that's what i don't i do not understand what's going on in ontario it's like if they just want to be like ugh. Okay, COVID's behind us. Let's just, you know. No, and I I agree. Like the app, like even when I walked into some campaign offices, they were shocked that someone was actually coming into their office. Like, what are you doing? Why are you here? Who are you? And then I got the interrogation, but that's that's here nor there. I want to ask the, oh, go ahead. You you gave the figures. I I have a question. Okay, go for it. But what if, for the average Ontario voter, Doug Ford is not as bad as what everyone says. Oh, he's not. You, I talked to many people who were on the streets in Ottawa, in downtown, like Toronto Centre. I was saying, what's your opinion of Doug Ford? I don't like him, but he's not done anything bad. I'm like, what? Okay. Then you need to go talk to people in rural Ontario. Who would you rather have, Doug Ford or Andrew Horvath? Well, Doug Ford, he really hasn't done anything. And he gave me money back for my license plate sticker. So I'm willing to vote for him again. He's all about customer service. It is. I feel like he has, he is the new conservative movement in some sense. The customer service, uh, like the customer service conservative movement. And I'm I am not surprised that he is doing so well because traditional dude, writings like the dude Trump. has his own brand. Let's not forget, <laughs> mm-hmm. Doug Ford is going to get it done. It's mm-hmm. not Ontario PCs will get it done. Yeah. It's all on, on Ford's back because I feel like people are willing to forgive Ford and give him another chance. And they're like, yeah, okay, COVID was extremely difficult to manage. We didn't know what we were doing. Uh, yeah, okay, we screwed up with LTC, but, you know, who did not? Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, and he, he did try to get a few things right. But, again, OHIP, there's, there was some blood test thing that came up this week that now you need to pay for a certain cancer markers test. Like nothing is going to be perfect ever. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. But I would say is Ontario on a government position is better off than Alberta right now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. My last question to you is this before we uh, jump out, because I, I, I just want to keep this short now, because we're going to have a lot of in-depth analysis on election night. Yeah. And that is, if you could sum up this election in uh, like a sentence or a paragraph, what would it be? Because I'm trying to figure out every election, like the 2018 election was the I hate Kathleen Wynne election. The one before that was I don't want, uh, I want Kathleen Wynne because I don't want Tim Hudak and his 100,000 uh, public sector jobs cut. Before that, it was faith-based schooling. I th- Is this the apathetic election? Is this the election that everyone's like, eh? an election i'll just go and vote if i even have time to go do it it's a post covid what could i say because we've had post covid elections we saw in ontario the federal election they came out but but... it's different like if we compare to alberta 
we really struggled with uh, freedom convoys. Uh, Ford tried to deal with those convoys and he was loud about it. Maybe the timing was questionable because he went snowmobiling or something. But, you know, it's, I think that what the people are thinking right now is that, okay, public sector didn't get cut that much. Health could be improved. Maybe we can try to lobby on that. Um, OHIP is a tire fire, but hey, we can try to fix it. Um, but he got her done and he will get it done. And we will. So the first time around was the Ontario PC with Doc Ford. But this time around is Doug Ford is going to get it done. Yeah. So I think they're more voting for one person than for regional representatives. So it's gonna be interesting to see, but it's post COVID, they're tired. They don't wanna deal with more, but again, like the NDP and the uh, Ontario, liberals. Liberal, liberals are they ready to jump in? I would say no. Or that has been there for how long? And she has done zit. Del Luca was, is part of the Win dynasty. Uh, people are not necessarily comfortable. So, you know. I don't think he's going to win his own riding. I was in his riding, driving around his own riding. He yeah. has, like, the conservatives are going to win that riding. Stephen Del Duca will like, not be leader after this election. I am putting the money like, on I'm that. I'm sorry, but are they even fucking trying at this point? Yeah. That's my question. Pardon for the, the, the swear, no. but is okay. anyone trying really? Because all we see is Ford. Yeah. And we got to give it to him. He's going to get it done. He is going to get it done, and we are going to get it done on June 2nd. Sarah Beggs, I want to thank you so much for doing this with me because it has been a pleasure as always to have you on the show. I just wanted to bounce some ideas off for somebody, and I always know you're up for a good chat about politics. So with that, uh, we'll be right back after this brief message for my exit for our Tuesday episode. Guys, talk to you later. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite. Be sure to hit that subscribe button today to be kept in the loop of all the great episodes that are coming up on the show. Also, click on the links in the show notes and follow our social media pages as well. So I want to thank Sarah Biggs for doing that last uh, 15 minutes with us. And I want to thank you for tuning in for the last two days because uh, we had nine days on the road and I can imagine that you probably just wanted to hear my voice for nine, for almost two hours straight yesterday and today, 381, 382, uh, about the Ontario election and what we saw and some of the sites we see. Um, we will be live, that's right, live, Thursday night, 745 Mountain Standard Time. Uh, where we're going to be breaking down the results and we have Sarah Biggs coming in. We have former member of parliament, Dan Harris back on the show and they're going to bring us some uh, interesting perspectives of what happened, what's next for the parties and where they go from here. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Have yourself an excellent rest of your day and remember everyone just keep talking. <laughs>